Hi, my name is Marcia Metzger, Director for Choose Now, a Georgia nonprofit organization that provides answers for parents and schools regarding sex education and controversial mental health curriculum. This is part three of four in a series of an open record request review that I did in the Tift County School Systems in Tifton, Georgia. So this next video is going to be about social and emotional learning and it will cover a, a sampling of some of the lessons that are taught um, from LGBTQ, sexual safety, and anti-racism. Now, when I reviewed this information with the schools, before I actually received the open record request information where I could get an account and look at this uh, in person, I actually had called Purpose Prep um, because the school had told me what curriculum they were using. So I called Purpose Prep to find out what kind of curriculum was in the uh, particular sessions and everything. And really what they were wanting to send me was basically the scope and sequence of all of the uh, information that they teach and not give me access to the actual lessons themselves. So anyway, by telling them, you know, what the law is in Georgia is that if you are a citizen there, you are to gain access to the material, no matter if it's a hard copy book or a video. So I kind of had to press on this and it took me a little while to get through to them um, what I needed. Well, because I had called the company ahead of time, I knew that they would be teaching these lessons ahead of time. And I was able to find them immediately and review them with the administration and we intercepted them. They said they would not have these lessons taught in Tift County. However, we're seeing that it appears that they're still going to use this uh, SEL program. And I still think that that is not the right direction that our school needs to go into. And you'll understand why once I complete this video. Uh, there is a lot more to it. Like in the video right before this, you saw all of the, all of the um, videos where they're collecting data on the students. Each video that they lesson they do, they have at the end of it and the end of the chapter, they have these activism assignments, it says call to action, and they answer these things. So data tracking, all of that is another reason, other than the fact that the information that this company is teaching is not even correct. So let's get busy and let's go ahead and start. So the other thing that was interesting with this particular setup was the strategic placement that where they placed these particular controversial lessons. And it took me so much time to unlock all of these classes because you have to go through them chronologically and complete the lesson before it allow you to access the next lesson. So when you look in this particular, uh, when you look in this particular system, uh, let me show you the video first and you will see once I start scrolling in the video, I just videoed myself before, once I start scroll, scrolling in the video, you will see just the number of assignments that are there and you will understand what's going on with it. So here we go. The purpose of this video is to discuss the strategic placement of the social emotional learning lessons in the Edgenuity platform that is in the actual class of social emotional learning by the name of Purpose Prep. Purpose Prep has several modules, and it would take me several minutes to just read every name of every module available to them. So these are all the different things. Some of these lessons could be quite possibly benign or even beneficial for your student, but the ones that I want to discuss with you are the ones that could actually harm your students. So you would have to determine for yourself, just what you want your student to learn about. Um, my guess is from seeing the news over the past few months and everyone that is lashing out against these school boards uh, because of these woke lessons within the schools, my guess would be that a lot of parents would not be in agreement to have their child 
in this indoctrinating kind of information. So you can make the decision yourself as I show you and consider why would purpose prep bury this information to where I would have to access it by going through 84 lessons. I think it was 84 lessons that I had to go to before I could unlock these uh, particular modules. It's, it's all housed right here in this climate and culture transformation uh, chapter. Climate and culture transformation, all three of these words would be buzzwords for the um, information that's controversial today. But let's just look at, there's four sections. And like I said, I had to go through every single one of these lessons before I could access this because they're locked until you complete them. So within each one of these lessons, as you'll see here, when I click on the LGBTQ lesson, uh, there's several lessons within it. Now, it, it's up to you. Maybe you are fine with your child being taught about LGBTQ. Uh, that is your parental right but there are many parents that do not want this information showcased on the public school platforms. And there are several parents that would not be down for teaching these woke lessons, uh, diversity, anti-racism, equity, and then certainly they would not be down for having their child uh, in a lesson that is action civics. The call to action assignments uh, these responses are recorded into a data record that is collected on your children. Some of their responses could even inform these data collection agencies, which probably could even end up in a government agency eventually. Uh, it could convey to them what the home, the family values are, the values, the beliefs, even probably the political affiliation that each family has. This is highly invasive to our privacy as a republic and uh, parents, no matter if you're for or against any of these kinds of things, do you really want a data record built for life on your child? Do you really want anyone to have that kind of information about you? This is Marsha Metzger with Choose Now. Consider what's going on and stay informed. Thank you. So that was quite a uh, camouflage attempt to keep parents from even auditing or looking at these lessons or administrators. Now, administrators may be able to go straight to them. I'm not sure you would have to ask them that. But for me to have to go through that many lessons just to get to it, um, uh, that's not transparent. And I think that uh, the company really is uh, being quite... Uh, irresponsible in that matter. The purpose of the this is one of the other uh, one of these videos that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to share with you just three videos. And remember, there are hundreds and hundreds of these videos available for your students to watch. So uh, LGBTQ teaching a student how to come out. That's what this one will be about. <laughs> How can I create a culture of respect and safety for those deciding to come out? Coming out is a process. There are 10 million Americans who are openly a part of the LGBTQ community, and each of them have their own story. Personally speaking, I had a dad who was very homophobic, and so he was very mentally and emotionally abusive towards me, and I let his ideologies and his opinion dictate how I would then um, conduct myself. And so I was very fearful to come out, and I was fine with staying in the closet simply because I thought that everyone would judge me. And so when I was 17 years old, my sister actually outed me to my family. After telling me that I could trust her and that she wouldn't tell anyone, she actually ended up telling my entire family. But still to this day, I would never take it back or have anything be different because I'm so appreciative. It took for her to push me like that for me to learn to become myself that much faster and, and be myself that much better. And I was so surprised because when I came out finally to my peers in high school, everyone received me with open arms. And it just was so funny to me because, you know, 
my fear of coming out was that everyone would treat me differently. And it was the complete opposite. People really respected me. People really admired me for being able to be myself. And so for those who are struggling with coming out, first, I want to say to you guys, it's okay. It is okay. You may feel alone. It may be times when you are alone, but trust that I care. There are millions of people in the world who care. So if you are watching this and you are contemplating coming out, when the time is right, it will happen. For those who um, don't have this particular struggle, ways in which you can support someone that's trying to come out is being compassionate. You never know someone's story. You can really negatively impact someone by judging them or by trying to bully them or make them feel some type of way about them being them. So I say be compassionate, be understanding, and be open. Now's the time to really learn how to deal with people who are different than you so that when you are older and an adult in the real world, um, you will be able to understand people that much better. But I just want to challenge you guys with one thing. If you know anyone in your school that's coming out, if you know anyone that may be bad it, I would like for you guys to go up to them and let them know how proud you are of them, for them being themselves, how proud you are of them, for them even opening up to allow their true self to shine through. I challenge you guys to do that. This is a young man that, you know, he is somebody's son. And I certainly don't want to say anything negative against this young man. However, he's making choices and, and he is, um, when he talked about his own dad and he talked about how his father's ideology was being pushed in on him. Well, we have a lot of impressionable children in our school system <clears throat> and he's, he's doing the same thing he's saying his dad did. He is sharing his ideology that would impact their lives. So this is another thing. I would think that many parents would not be um, in line with this at all. I would, I would find it quite, um, I find it quite surprising if you did not have some kind of response that would not be positive in this respect. Uh, this young man, he has, uh, I don't know. When we think about how our students might be processing this information for themselves, and you'll see like last session, we talked about the assignment that was connected with this. And within that assignment, it's talking about sexuality where we should be very open with our sexuality. And there are many, many people that their religious beliefs do not align with homosexuality that is against what they believe to be proper for a Christian or people in Islam. There's other religions the same way, and there's just traditional beliefs. So this ideology, once again, it is a worldview, and it is not uh, something that needs to be taught in the schools. We don't teach these things. These are things people decide for themselves, and this is just inappropriate. Now let's talk about sexual safety. Now as a, an instructor for sexual abstinence education, I'm a sexual risk avoidance specialist. I talk with students about sexual, sexually transmitted diseases and infections a great deal. And I go into uh, explaining to them what their risks truly are. It takes me several days to go through the curriculum that I use. And for this particular video to say this in just a matter of just a few minutes, and it just barely touch all of this information. And for this to be shared as the sex education curriculum uh, that, I mean, when I did the open record request, the reason I started looking into social emotional learning was because the director of curriculum there, Mr. Norman, Dr. Norman told me that, that they were using this program to teach sex education. Now, I didn't find any other sex education classes uh, or modules other than this one in the whole, uh, in the rest of it. So if this is what they were planning to teach and use, I'm glad we intercepted it because this particular young man 
uh, if, if he is a homosexual recipient partner, he factually represents the highest risk on the spectrum for HIV AIDS or any other STD or STI. His sexual orientation and his gender identity are his business. And we aren't here to just demean this young man in any way, but for him to be used as the teacher for our students is about one of the most dangerous things that I have ever seen in the field of sex education. You can go to these two websites, cdc.gov and oasis.state.georgia.us, and you can find these statistics to prove what I'm saying. It has nothing to do with being a homophobe or a racist or anything like that. These are facts. Know the facts for yourselves and why Purpose Prep would think that using this young man to teach the next lesson that you're going to see on video is okay is beyond me. I think it's one of the most irresponsible things I've ever seen. What does it mean to practice sexual safety? Well, first, I want to start by saying that I understand that at some point in time in life, maybe you will have a sexual experience, but it's important to be safe. There are so many things in this world that can occur to you from having unsafe sex. So I want you to really pay attention to what I'm gonna say. First, make sure you get consent. Every single time requires consent. No means no. If someone doesn't seem like they want to, if someone doesn't seem like they're in their right mind, if someone body language is not telling you that they want to, that means no. Uh, for sure, yes, every time is the green light to even practice sexual safety. That's first. Second, there are different contraceptives that help in practicing safe sex. The first one is birth control. Birth control is helpful in preventing pregnancy. That is all that birth control is helpful for doing. You cannot take birth control and expect not to have or get any STIs or STDs. That is not the right contraceptive for that. The ideal contraceptive to use to practice sexual safety is condoms. Condoms are 99% of the time going to you can tell he does not believe STIs, that STDs and pregnancies however what a lot of people don't understand is there are a lot of STIs that you can still get when using a condom seal the first one being HPV HPV is an STI that is transmitted through skin contact so simply rubbing up against someone bare skin can transmit HPV Although abstinence is the for sure way to 100% abstain from STIs, STDs, and pregnancies, it's not always the most realistic answer. And so that's why it's important to practice safe sex. If you are sexually active and you need to see a doctor for testing or to get contraceptives such as birth control or um, condoms, you don't have to necessarily have your parents' permission to speak to your doctor about these things. Your doctor can give you insight that your parents cannot give you. It's not that you want to have secrecies or secrets that you're keeping from your parents, but it's to know that if you're not getting that information from your parents, there are still other avenues to gain that information to make sure that you're protecting yourself. The reason that is important to gain consent before practicing any sexual activity is because there is a such thing as rape. There are millions of people in the world who have experienced rape or date rape, which is the act of involuntarily having your body used in ways that you're not personally looking for. And so that's why it's important to gain consent so that you're sure that you're not hurting anyone mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. There are some STDs and STIs that are uncurable. There are some STDs and STIs and diseases that you may get from not practicing safe sex that will stick with you for the rest of your life, that you will have to take medication for. There are some STIs and STDs that unfortunately kill people because they are so toxic to your body and your healthy blood cells. I challenge you to look up how important it is to practice safe sex and to also look up 
different STIs or STDs that you could realistically get from not practicing sexual safety. So when we talk about practicing sexual safety, the CDC also tells us that sexuality uh, with multiple partners is not safe. There is no such thing as safe sex outside of a monogamous relationship. This is fact. Now, you can have safer sex if you use condoms, and goodness knows we tell students, even in the abstinence classes, if you are going to do it, you better use a condom, and it increases your chances of, of not catching one as, as readily, for sure. I mean, it'll reduce the risk somewhat, but when you promote this and call it safe sex, no, that is not a good, that, that, I mean, it's just not true. It's not fact. So now you caught the voice inflection and I kind of chimed in. He, he didn't even believe what he said about 99% effective because it's not true. And, you know, for inexperienced young people, they don't even know how to put on condoms properly and how to store them correctly, things of that nature. So, you know, the message that he also taught on consent, it is so weak. It is just unbelievably weak. And if students were to just see this video and think they were good to go, as long as a person says yes, um, you know, people can change their mind. People can withdraw consent. Uh, I've seen too many young people end up with charges coming against them uh, because they thought they had consent and the person with them changed their mind. So uh, sex, being labeled a sexual predator is something that you may never get out of. It's hard to prove that you didn't uh, that you didn't act out on a person if they're saying they didn't give you consent. It's very challenging and it's very expensive. It's embarrassing and it can be overwhelming to both parties. So when we set kids up like this, it's unbelievable, unbelievably wrong. And for purpose prep to, again, use this person who doesn't know what he's talking about for one thing. And the fact that he is the highest risk on the spectrum, it appears by the way he presents himself. Um, it just demonstrates they do not use evidence-based data to design their curriculum. Um, also, what about how he did the, the little talk about you don't necessarily have to tell your parents. I have seen this Planned Parenthood curriculum by ETR and they undermine the parents constantly. They do role play in the classrooms that are, that's inappropriate. There's all kinds of things that I can show you. And if you go to stopcse.org, that stands for Comprehensive Sex Education, and you can look at the different curricula that they have reviewed and exposed, you can definitely see for yourself what I'm talking about. Uh, this is not a good thing. Uh, this product is, every time I'm, I see and see this, I just want to just reaffirm to the parents that this needs to be rejected, this whole program. Here's the last video I have for you on racism and anti-racism. And I want to tell you this before I play it. This is the book by Ibram X. Kendi. Now, the video I'm showing you, he doesn't mention this man's name, but he does in other videos that I've seen. And I just want to read you um, one of the, it's on page 19 in this particular book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. This is practically the Bible that they, they claim uh, for uh, critical race theory lessons. But let's just read this one, this one little sentence, well, it's two sentences. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. How will that leave the children? No matter what race you are, how will that leave people of color versus white people? And by the way, white is a color too. All of this, now I know I'm a white person, but I'm just, I'm just saying, 
while some people may have a privilege attitude to someone else, that's a judgment call. That that's what they're saying. Don't judge the LGBTQ, and that your thoughts can be unlearned and improved. Well, I think there's some unlearned thoughts and improvements that could happen here as well. So once you see this, we'll discuss it again. But this is not fair to any child because I know of kids that are great friends that are mixed races all the way through. We have kids that have a white mother and a black father. I mean, this is creating so much dissension. It's unbelievable, but, but just, just watch this video and we'll talk in just a moment. What is systemic racism? First, racism is defined by social scientists as a system of advantage based on race. In order for that to happen, one group must have the power to turn their prejudice and discrimination into daily practice. And not all groups have the power to shape daily life. You can see this in government, law enforcement, the legal system, education, banking, media, and so on. A systemic racism is a term used to describe how systems and structures that are a part of everyday life create inequity based on race. Systemic racism ultimately creates a situation in which there are more hurdles for people who are, in this case, not white. For example, research shows that with the exact same resumes, people with traditional sounding names like Tom, John, Sarah, and Rachel are twice as likely to get a callback for a job than people with ethnic sounding names like Jamal, Samir, Sharondo, or Jalen. Everyone has the potential to be treated unfairly by any system, but some groups are treated unfairly disproportionately. A big example of this you may hear about in the news is police brutality and the shooting of unarmed African Americans. Even though many white people are also shot by police officers, there is a disproportionate number of unarmed African Americans shot. Since 2015, over 2,400 white people have been killed by police, while over 1,300 uh, blacks and 907 Latinos have been killed by police. But when we look at that by deaths per million, blacks are 31 out of a million, Latinos are 23 per million, and whites are 13 per million. That is a disproportion. Another example is in criminal justice. According to decades of research, if you were born a black teen, male or female, you are more likely to be tried for a first offense, receive jail time for a first offense, receive longer prison sentences, and be tried as an adult for the same offense as white teens or male or female. Another example is if you are in an American history class, but your curriculum does not incorporate the contributions of people who are not white or a literature class and you don't read any literature written by non-white authors and poets. That is also called underrepresentation. Now, reverse racism is a little complicated, but the simple answer is no, it is not real. Although all of us have the ability to be prejudiced and discriminate against others, not all of us can turn that prejudice into laws, policies, and social practices. In the United States, white people have historically controlled our systems and institutions and race relations. Think of it this way. Are there any laws or policies that have been created and passed by non-white people that discriminated against white people, either on purpose or on accident? No. So until white people have been systematically marginalized through slavery, racial terrorism, Jim Crow, and other attempts to stop them from voting and other practices, I cannot say reverse racism is real. What's the difference between prejudice and racism? That's an important question and an important distinction. Prejudice is, which we all are capable of being prejudiced, is simply prejudging or making judgments about someone or something with very limited information. On the other hand, racism is a system of advantage based on race. So the difference between racism and prejudice can be thought of this way. Uh, you can be prejudiced against people, say, with an accent. But unless you have the power to pass laws or policies on how those people are treated, um, then you're not really being racist. Again, the thing that's really important about racism is understanding that it's about power and how folks can use power to shape the conditions for other people. So 
this is like in the last video that I did and I described the double bind. There are parents on that are black. There are parents that are white that are not down for this. There are parents that are Latino that are not down for this or Asian or any other race. Promoting this kind of information in our schools and pitting students against one another, that does not sound like it promotes peace. It doesn't sound like anything except creating activists and disrupting the peace in our schools. This is irresponsible, it's incorrect. And in Georgia, our governor has said that we were not going to do this. So this particular uh, purpose prep program, it just looks worse by the minute. I would absolutely um, call them and let them know you do not consent to have your child in this program. Now on the next page. All right, so I highlighted that last line in that one paragraph he said that where he says there is no such thing as reverse racism. Racism is a character flaw. This is something that people do individually. Um, you know, there's an argument about systemic racism and whether or not people are down for that and believe it, that is an ideology and that is something that adults need to discuss. Children do not need to be brought into this. This is totally, this is just wrong to put this on children. It is just wrong. All right, so that um, concludes this particular video. I will be back on here shortly to upload the third uh, part. Well, actually this will be part four of four. Uh, so we'll get that done and we'll go over the Edgenuity Health book and it's taught basically in the ninth and 10th grade and then puberty, the wonder years, fourth and fifth grade. And I believe the grades in between, I think there's like either they don't talk about it a lot. Uh, I don't know if they have a, a certain program for those grades, but uh, sometimes they will teach when puberty is onset to start with, and then they'll revisit this in a stronger way in the eighth, ninth, 10th grade. So that's how they generally do it in the schools. So anyway, this is Marsha Metzger with Choose Now. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to just um, concluding this with you guys and just being here as a consultant for Tift County. Thank you.